Hello, everyone. Welcome to iNACOL's October Teacher Talk webinar. My name is Natalie Abel. I'm a program manager here at iNACOL, and I'll be helping to facilitate tonight's webinar. So before we get started here with our presenters, I have just a few administrative items. I promise not to take up too much of your time. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a chat box. If you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself. Let us know who you are, where you're tuning in from, what you're hoping to learn today. If you brought any questions with you, please be sure to ask those too. And we welcome questions throughout the webinar through the chat box as well. It's a great place for a rich discussion, so we can ensure that those questions get answered either as we go or at the very end we'll save some time for Q&A as well. And if you are a member of the Twitterverse, you can tag Buddy and Brooke, and you can tag iNACOL as well. And you can share what you're learning using hashtag teacher tools, and we'll be sure to um, share those with our networks as well. Tonight's webinar will be recorded and archived on the iNACOL.org website. So we'll send you an email after this webinar with a link and you'll be able to download the slide deck, and you'll be able to view the webinar in its entirety. So you can refer back to this webinar at any time in the future. And with that, I'm grateful to have father-daughter duo Buddy and Brooke Berry from Eminence Independent Schools in Kentucky with us this evening. We're going to be exploring instructional tools for personalized learning. And if you came to the iNACOL Symposium last year, you witnessed Buddy give one of the best keynotes I've ever seen. And if you missed it, there's a great video on YouTube that you should check out. And if you're joining us in San Antonio next week for the iNACOL Symposium, you'll get a chance to see Buddy and Brooke present together there, too. So that's a session you don't want to miss. So with that, I will now turn it over to Buddy and Brooke. Thank you. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, we are uh, Buddy Berry and Brooke Berry from uh, Eminence, Kentucky, and um, we are excited to be with you guys tonight. Um, uh, if you can tell by the screen, if you want to join us in the conversation, she mentioned tagging us along with the other hashtags. We are at Buddy Berry and at Brooke T. Berry on Twitter. Um, our school district that we represent is Eminence in K Kentucky, which is at Eminence Schools, and that's located in central Kentucky, uh, just between, about halfway between Louisville and Lexington. So we're right in the heart of the Bluegrass State. Um, and again, there's there's no group that we speak more fondly of than I make out for our transformation as a part of our journey of personalization. And so um, we're excited to present to you tonight. We thought the best way to do so would be to go and let um, – really let Brooke take it and kick it off. Um, Brooke's going to bring a perspective from the student-teacher role. Um, she's going to try to cover <clears throat> Web 2.0 tools and some ways to implement them in the classroom and to embed them into instruction. And then I'm going to come back on the back side and show how those tools and other tools can be used to uh, embed to make awesome lessons. And so we're really excited to be together. Look forward to your questions and uh, being with you for the next little bit. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brooke. Um, hi, I'm Brooke Berry, an eighth grader at Eminence Independent School. And um, technology is one of my biggest passions. I just love doing it, and I love using it at school every day. So I'm going to show about 20 tech tools in about 20 minutes, and I want you all to pick one that you think is awesome that you've never seen before or maybe you have seen but you haven't used it very much, and take that back to your school district and embed it into a classroom. Now, let's get started. The first tool is todaysmeet.com. It's a back channel and a web 2.0 tool. You can have virtual conversations on it, and you can even take questions from the students. So here is what today's meet looks like when you are creating a room. Once you've created a room, as many people that you want to get on it can get on it. So you go to todaysmeet.com, you type in the room name, and then you give that link. So it would be like todaysmeet.com forward slash the name that you choose. You give that out to everybody you would like, and they can join and have a conversation with you. So this is, would be an example link, would be, so if I was creating one maybe for my classmates, would be todaysmeet.com forward slash B. 
So this picture is from Zootopia, Disney, one of Disney's movies. And in this scene, they are addressing the elephant in the room. So I'm going to do the same. The elephant in the room is Google. About 70% of what I use most is Google. But about 90% of my presentation is on everything else I use in the classroom. Google Drive. It's home of all Google Docs, from Docs, Forms, Surveys, Presentations, Spreadsheets. Google Drive has it. If you go to Google, you click on Google Drive, and um, then you're there. It's easily embedded into your LMS. Scrambler.ca is actually from Canada, hence the CA. Canada is not just for maple syrup anymore. It's also for really cool websites. So you create a room, just like you did on today's meet, and then you give that link out to everyone, and they can join. The only um, part that I don't love as much about Scrumbler is that you can't join a room on an iPad, but you can on everything else. So you go into Scrumbler, you type in your room name, give that link out to everyone, like I said, and they can join. So once you're on the room, you can compare and contrast. Um, it has sorting exercises, and you can add any amount of columns that you need or as little as you need. So on this one, I'm comparing and contrasting Web 2.0 tools and social media. Made with code, uh, actually, sorry, Kid Blog was, um, it's a safe way for kids to learn how to blog. And my school turns off the comments, so only views are allowed. And one time, it was really cool, I had over thousands of people viewing one of my test blogs I had done. So that was really cool for me, because it had a map and showed me where they were. So this is what Kid Blog looks like, and I have even done a couple of assignments on here, like one where I did a review of Wolfgang Puck. So I thought um, this is a really neat way to turn in my assignments and writing assignments a little differently. Screencast-O-Matic. Others um, like Screencast-O-Matic would include QuickTime Player. It's used for virtual, blended, and flipped content classes. And so how I used it one time was um, I was going to present somewhere, but I had also agreed to do a volleyball game. So I had a presentation and a volleyball game at the same time. And I can't be two places at once. So I was like, maybe the computer can do it for me. And a computer cannot play volleyball, so it presented for me. Clickers. It's awesome. It's a formative assessment and a quick way to know the audience's answers. Please do not get Flickers confused with pickers in a classroom because that's just nasty. So Flickers is an app, and the screen will look like this once you've downloaded the app. So you just scan the audience's answers, and it will put them into a chart, and it, if you click, like, there's a right answer, or maybe there's not a right answer, it'll show you who got it right and who got it wrong. Padlet.com um, actually used to be Wallwisher, so maybe you've heard of Padlet or Wallwisher. For for those of you that maybe have never heard of either one, you can add videos, pictures, text, links, all that into one board. And it's a virtual brainstorming board, and it's great for note-taking and graphic organization. So this is what Padlet looks like. And again, you can give this link out to anyone that you want so that they can work on something with you. Like on this one, it was me and a classmate working together with two fourth graders on a storyboard outline. So we were all coming up with different settings and characters for our story we were writing together. Google Earth, I'm sure all of you have heard of this. Um, it's located at google.com forward slash earth. And this is actually a picture of a kindergartner's walkthrough um, through Google Earth. And they used Google Cardboard, which are just um, cardboard goggles. And you slip your phone inside pull up Google Earth, and then you can look around, and it's like you're there. So um, this is what a kindergartner did as their walkthrough, and they just pointed out the shapes they saw in Disney World. Archive.org is a free public access to millions of websites, music, images, books, and more. It also includes the Wayback Machine. The Wayback Machine is a website time machine. So um, if you had heard of Padlet when it was called Wallwisher, 
you can actually go to archive.org and go into the Wayback Machine, type in Wallwisher, and it will show you a picture of what that website looked like back when it was called Wallwisher. And you can do that with any site, and it should have a picture there. Um, so another thing, you can play games on Internet Archive. And my favorite game that Internet Archive has is an oldie but a goodie. That's the Oregon Trail. So um, it's a really fun game, and my teacher used it, like, to show us what life was like in that time. And sadly, all the things I learned was all the ways you could die. So it's not a very happy game, but it's still kind of fun to play. So scratch.mit.edu is a free coding program, and it has over 5 million users. It's a really easy way to create video games. Uh, for example, I made a Pong game, and I also, for my SDLP project last year, me and a few other girls from my class created a dance game on Scratch, and we used a Makey Makey, which is something that plugs into your computer, and then you... It has other wires that you can control the arrows on your um, keyboard. So, like, we made a dance mat on the floor, and we plugged the Make and Make into our computer, and then we connected each of the arrows to the dance mat. Um, that way that the kids could play the dance game with their feet on the mat and still play the game, which is on the computer. So that is one. And it, wasn't, it didn't take that long to make because it's all really easy. Another example is a... Students at Eminence was sad when Flappy Bird was shut down, so they decided to create their own. Um, so I thought it was really, like, almost exactly like it. It was really cool how they were able to keep score and do the flapping thing. Tinkercad.com is online CAD for students, computer-aided design, and you make 3D renderings, and then you print them on a 3D printer. Kindergartners can use it, and it's super easy, and it even has, if you don't know how to use it, it'll have a help button where it will walk you through how to make and what the different parts of it are, like their shapes, numbers, letters, and it'll show you how to use all that. And you can have your first one done in 10 minutes. Um, for example, I made our school when I was um, younger. I made our school into a castle, and I was even able to make, like, a little doorway that had a space, so it was kind of indented, and it was really cool. FreeRice.com is a free website. Um, it has most major content, and um, so it has math, reading, science, social studies, and it's really repetitive work. So I will be honest, it's not one of my favorites, but it's great for students who um, like that repetitive work. The one thing I do like about free rice, though, is that players earn 10 grains of rice for every correct question. So the grains of rice go to the hungry places. So, like, if every time I answer the um, math question right, it donates 10 grains of rice to a hungry place. So that's the part I like and mainly why I use it. Dippity.com is a timeline generator website. You can create your own or view others. Uh, it's really great. Um, I mainly use it for social studies when we're doing maybe somebody's timeline of their life or of a um, city or something like that. So you can insert pictures. This one does not, but you are able to do that. And this is a Disney World ride timeline of when new brides were created. Um, so, yeah, that's Dippity. Wordle.net is a word cloud creator. You can copy or insert text. And so what Wordle does it is once you've copied and pasted, um, for example, on this one, I copied and pasted in an eminent text, and it turned all of the big word wordy text into a word cloud, and it made the most used word bigger and bolder. So, like, of course, eminence is big, and tomorrow, dream, school, and there's Disney. I like Disney, and so that's why that's probably a big one. And you can even change the color and size of the word cloud. GoAnimate.com is a cloud-based platform. You can create, share, and customize cartoons. 
you can have animated video, you make animated videos, and you can use your voice or an animated voice. Uh, you get to choose. Go animate, though, it does cost. You get about, I think it's either a 12-day free trial, and then after that you pay um, a certain amount per month to get to use it. But it is really cool. So this is just a picture of a video that um, someone at Eminence made, and you can see how they had the character, and they had the eyes looking at the computer, and they were able to adjust every little detail to make it the way they wanted. The next tool is Powtoon.com. It's a web-based animation software, and it has cartoon drawings, and it is a lot easier than GoAnime. So um, this one is free, and I would prefer for me using Powtoon over GoAnime just because it's easier, but they both are awesome. So this is just um, a sample. This is one that I used as part of my test. Um, on the branches and about our government. So what I did was I able I was able to take pictures of a different background or a color, and then it added that in as the background. And then I got to choose like what I wanted the words to say on what I wanted it to say. So like on this one, it's against a sign and says what I want it to say. Wix.com. It's a website creator, host, and publisher. You can add pictures, videos, apps, and games. Uh, it is really easy to use, and it has a lot of different types of websites you can choose from. So you can start blank, or it has like a blog one, or um, food one, and um, the food one would be like, it already has some pictures of, and it'll show you, like, add this picture of your favorite food here, and it'll walk you through all of those steps. So here's a sample of one that I used as part of a science project about meerkats. And it's easy enough for elementary to use it, but my dad is able to do his dissertation on it. So um, it's good for all ages, I guess. Keepvid.com is awesomely cool. You download videos off YouTube instantly. So you just copy and paste the link into Keepvid, and it will download the video for you. So you get to choose, like, what size you want it and how big you want it and how much of your screen you want it to cover. It has all those different options. Uh, but it is really easy, and um, I just think it's really cool for, like, um, if I can't, if I don't know if the Internet will be working, it's, um, maybe someplace I'm going, like at um, the SPLP conference or somewhere, I am able to download the video that I want at home, and then I will have it without having in without having to need internet at the conference. Collaborate.com is probably one of my favorites. You take pictures and you make them talk. So it's a way to spice up any presentation, and it's for funny flipped content. So how it works, you can probably see a little black line in that um, uh, animal's mouth, and so you would crop the mouth off, and then you get to you can record your own voice, use a song or a video off of YouTube, and um, it will make the picture move its mouth to the way of the words that are being said. Bitchstrips.com, you create any comic strip. And it helps students with self-expression, storytelling, and reading comprehension. So this one, it has cartoon um, characters just like Powtoon and GoAnimate did. And you can create little uh, word bubbles and all that stuff. And so you can do a storyboard outline. You can actually create the comic strip, whatever you want to use it for. That's what you can use it for. And you can choose how the characters stand, like if you want to make it look like they're walking or um, if you want to have one open its mouth, or you want one's eyes really big or really small, you get to decide all that. Rewordify um, is really good for reading classrooms because it helps students understand what they're reading, and it increases vocabulary. So how it does, it, um, it, what it does is it allows students to read harder text. So this is an astrophysic um, website off of NASA. 
And what we did, what I did was copy and paste the link into Rewordify. Rewordify changed the text, com well, not completely, but it changed the words that it thought were harder to read and um, pulled up a new website, and it had all highlighted words. And so the highlighted words are words that Rewordify changed. And if you put your mouse over the highlighted area, it will show you what word was there before. That way, next time you see it, you'll know, and you won't even have to use Rewordify. So um, it's very simple, very easy to use, and it helps a lot in those reading classrooms. This next tool is a digital citizenship, and it's for di you get your digital driver's license. Dr. Jerry Swan invented it, and so it is a free open source web resource called Otis. And what it does is um, you log in, and then it will have questions about what different pictures are. Like, you get to choose, is this picture Photoshopped or real? And if you get it right, it'll move you on to the next stage. And if you get it wrong, you just have to redo that portion of the test. So it just gets students prepared to use the Internet safely. And we all have to get it at imminence before we're allowed to take our computers home and use them. And if we get a computer violation, then we have to completely retake the DDL test. And once we have it again, we can um, prove to our teachers that we can use the Internet safely. So that's how imminence uses it. This app is um, the newest. and we have, um, it's Google Expeditions, so it takes you on a virtual field trip, and the teacher gets to control where the field trip is being taken to. So um, you could go to Paris, you could go um, underwater, you can go to any places that you can think of that relate to the unit you're teaching. And what you do is you can use the Google Cardboard, and you have your phone in there, and the teacher can point to stuff, like this one's being taken underwater. So the teacher can use an arrow and point to maybe some type of fish or a dolphin or something and then talk to the class about it, and they don't even have to leave the room. So the students can, they get to control where they're looking, but the teacher controls um, where they're going, and then they can have an arrow pointing to one side of the um, place so that they know, um, look over there and check that out. So um, that one thing that you were supposed to find, um, just take that back to your classroom and see how you can embed it into the um, into your classroom. Uh, and if you want to put what you thought was your favorite app, and just put that into the um, chat, and I can see what you all thought was your favorite. All right. Uh, for whatever reason, we're not able to see the chat. <laughs> if anybody has any questions for Brooke, um, just go ahead and enter those now, and we'll try to uh, we'll ask her here in the next couple minutes. Thank you, Brooke and Buddy. I haven't seen any specific questions come through yet. We are seeing a lot of folks who like rewordify. And we had one vote for keepvid.com. I really liked the Google Expedition. I thought that was really, really cool. And Pete Toomey said he had to pick two. He liked Screencast-O-Matic and KeepVid. Well, we, so we if now, anybody has any questions. This is our first time on the Blackboard, and so now we found where to click the room to see the conversation. So we're, we're up to speed again. So. Um, well, thank you, and, and I want to say thank you to Brooke. I apologize that we had to do the format that we did, but uh, Brooke is an avid dancer, and so uh, she is heading to dance class tonight. So we will let her go, and um, sadly, you are now stuck with, uh, you're with me. So as I was uh, thinking about today and, and thinking about what uh, might be best for teachers is how can I take and make my class and lessons meaningful? So <laughs> if I was to sum up, what makes an awesome school? It's great teachers with great lessons. 
And so if you could go and create the dream school, it's as many meaningful lessons as you can put together. And I thought, well, what is it that quantifies as a meaningful lesson? Like what, what does a meaningful lesson look like? And I got looking at the definition of meaningful. Is it significant? Is it relevant? Is it important? Is it telling? Is it valid? Does it have serious, important, or useful purpose? You know, does it make our lives rich and meaningful? And so, you know, when you think about the lessons you do on a daily basis, can you use those words to describe your, your, your day or your talk or, or what your, you know, your interaction with students or their level of engagement? <laughs> and so as I was thinking about that, there are three things. I think you could sum it up into three elements that most meaningful lessons, uh, you know, include, at least at eminence. And this is what we try to have our teachers strive for um, every day. Um, and they are, uh, they begin with the intersection of best and next practice. Um, and you say, well, what is that? Well, best practice is something that we've known for years, which is, you know, the, the good questioning, formative assessments, um, standards-based grading in recent years, um, the ability to go and, um, and, and do good questioning techniques, classroom management, all of the stuff that makes for a great teacher that we were taught in college. The problem, and where a lot of teachers are, are, are having to learn post-college and, and post-starting their career or even mid-careers uh, like myself, is next practice. And you say, well, what is next practice? I believe next practice is using technology to accomplish best practice at higher levels. And so it might be through some of those web 2.0 tools that you saw Brooke uh, share. You know, the one thing is Brooke's probably spoken to Ten to 20,000 people on apps to use, and she knows hundreds. Uh, those are some that she picked for today. Um, and she knows how to really work with teachers on how to embed them into classes and into instruction and how to use them. And when she first started doing that, she was 10, and she said, Daddy, she goes, I kind of feel like a liar because nobody at Eminence does these things. And this was about four years ago. Um, two years later, she comes back to me, and she said, Daddy, she goes, every person in my class knows how to do every one of these tools that I'm talking about. And what a 12-year-old was explaining was systemic change. We had had sy systemic change. We believe in teaching kids hundreds of tools and then giving them the freedom to use those tools when they think they can convey their learning in a, a richer, more powerful way other than just a straight standardized test. And so um, that's the intersection of best and next. Um, and so the second ingredient is the element of surprise and delight, right? And, and so how do you make the lesson rock? Like what separates that lesson from just being crazy awesome? Um, and you say, well, well, buddy, give me some examples. Well, surprise and delight might be as simple as the teacher in a costume for that day. Or it might be that when you're talking about certain math things, you may bring in cooking ingredients. Or maybe if you have a passion for repurposing furniture, maybe you tie in your passion with the lesson um, so that the kids can really connect to what makes you tick and what makes you um, uh, uh, something that really gets you excited. Or maybe you find out and you do extensive uh, interest inventories. At Eminence, we do student DNA. It's called a digital narrative album. It tracks all of the information about a kid that most schools and districts don't track. You know, most districts track grades, attendance, behavior. Um, we track what do you want to be when you grow up? What are you passionate about? What are hobbies are you into? What do you love doing with your free time? And then our teachers try to embed those, those uh, attributes into their lessons. And so um, it, it's, it makes the learning that much more rich. I was walking down the hall uh, about a year ago, and I heard something. It was a history class, and I, and I heard um, everything but history. And I thought, well, that's unusual. And I, I stuck my head in the door. And, and you could see a teacher that had redecorated their entire classroom as a speakeasy um, to really convey it. And so the entire day, the, the kids had no idea it was coming. And she had surprised them with um, uh, a way of, of going and just having a, a, a mind-blowing lesson. And so the kids were just blown away. I was walking down the hall recently, and I look in a first-grade classroom, and a horse's head was, was coming in through the window um, because the kids were going to, um, they were they were studying empathy, 
And so they were putting their, for design thinking from Stanford University, and so they were, were putting themselves in the, in the place of that horse and how it felt. And, 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 and so the teacher had literally lined up somebody to, to just all of a sudden bring the horse's head in. So all different types of surprise and delight. It's just ways of making it uh, much more rich. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have came in, and it says, what a great idea to track these things. Do you have a tool to use to do this? Um, we use our LMS. We've created within our LMS uh, basically a one-page narrative, and the parent, the teacher, and the student can all go and input um, the data. And I'll give you a perfect example. We went and spoke, uh, Brooke and I did, at the National School Board Convention in New Orleans. And Brooke, who's a, just a, I, I love her to death, and she's so unique and different and quirky, and she reminds me a little bit of me. She said um, she fell in love with Southern architecture down there, the big mansions and the houses. And so um, when we came back, I was able to put that on her student DNA to update it. And then within two weeks, a, a teacher of hers was using that uh, for her to do that as a lens for studying the Civil War. Uh, and so the teacher saw that I had updated it, saw that that was something that was relevant to Brooke, and then embedded it into it, and um, it was uh, great. Uh, and so um, I see that Tony says, can you share a screenshot of what it looked like? Be glad to and include it with the presentation. And then finding out how a student is wired is huge. And then for us, um, beyond that, and, and, and get to this a little more in a minute, with personalized learning, we, we found the need. We're totally competency-based. We believe in progression. So if a kid doesn't finish all of their competencies for third grade, when they move on to fourth grade, as long as they've met 80% of them, they move on. But we don't start them with fourth grade content. We'll start them with the 20% of third grade content that they still need. So a lot of people say, well, how do you track that? Well, we literally invented our own app. It's called the COCO app, and it's the competency collector application. And so it goes and allows teachers to screenshot, video capture, uh, uh, document upload, and it's to try to get where we can monitor students' competencies met. It creates a dashboard for parents and for teachers and for students to get an instant look on how they're doing with their standards in all of their core classes and in the eight critical attributes of every learner that we care about at Emmett. We have our own standards. And so it's a lifetime um, data for the for them to be able to um, to look in on that on their progression, it'll maybe say seventy percent of the standards met, and it will say uh, that is twenty percent of the overall standards for the year. So you have two numbers for every course, and then you can drill down and actually see the evidence that the teachers are using to say that they met the competencies. Um, just been a very powerful tool. We're all about personalizing it down to the student level, um, and then lastly is a yes and mentality. Uh, and you say, wow, what is, a, what is Yes And? Yes And is literally the centerpiece of eminent schools. We refuse to believe that there's nothing that we can't accomplish if we set ourselves out to do it. So we, it, we had, and the COCO app's a great example of that. We had a need to go and track the competencies of individual students, and we realized that the only way that we could do that was to design something that didn't exist. There's no software designers in this building. We, we found out it was going to cost $50,000 to do it. And we just kept yes-anding it until we designed it, we drew it, we took our ideas, and I just started calling investors. And I found an angel investor that gave us 50 grand to a small school in central Kentucky because they saw the power and the passion behind the idea. That's yes-and thinking. Uh, on a big level. Um, we invented the Wi-Fi bus for sure in Kentucky, and some people think nationally. Um, it, we've been doing the Wi-Fi bus now for about five or six years, and it was invented because of the need. We were having students drive back and forth on a bus to an early college uh, site, and we had a teacher that complained that we were wasting 10 hours of instruction of our best kids a week. And so rather than just discount her and say, yes, but they're earning an $80,000 associate's degree for free, um, rather than do that, we said, yes, you're right. Let's figure out how to solve that. So every kid had the laptop. The content was all online uh, on our LMS. So we just had to figure out how to get Wi-Fi on a school bus. And so when we called all of the Wi-Fi companies, they all said, well, that doesn't exist. And we went, and um, I said, well, send me a hotspot, and I'll make this work. And our bus maintenance director welded it on, and our tech uh, uh, guru 
went and put all of our filters on the um, the bus, and so um, it was awesome. Um, and so then the, the second stage of that, the one thing that we had to yes and most recently, we couldn't couldn't figure out how to get Wi-Fi to our houses of poverty, and so um, E-Rate was not allowing me to send out the signal from our school, but I realized that they could not tell me where to park the buses. And so we literally started parking our school buses about a year and a half ago in our housing complexes so that the kids would have uh, internet uh, usage at night. It, it's awesome. And we park them by the clubhouse, which is open all night long, and uh, it just works really great. Yes, and thinking looks like that. I had a teacher that I was doing a presentation for last week, and she said, well, give me a yes and example for the problem I'm facing. And I said, well, what is that? She goes, well, and she had seen Brooke do the Google Expeditions. And she said, I would just die to have a station of Google Expedition goggles in my classroom. And she goes, I've done the math. And the math is I'm going to need three goggles minimum to create a station. And she said, the three goggles alone, she goes, how expensive are, are they? And I said, well, you can get those Mattel viewers for 30 bucks, 10 bucks each. You can pay 30 bucks. She goes, well, that's not bad. And she goes, but what do you have inside of them? And I said, well, it takes a Galaxy or an Android or an iPhone. Like, you're going to have to have a device in it. And she goes, well, that's, you know, $1,200 to $1,500. She goes, I'll never. She goes, I've not raised that much money in my classroom in a decade. And I said, well, let's yes and think it. And so I started proposing ideas for her. And I said, how many people bought an iPhone 7 when it came out? About half of the room raised their hand. And I said, that's probably true for the parents in the in your class as well. And I said, so what if you sent a letter home and said, how many of the parents, we're getting ready to do field trips all across the world. We're going to look at the Louvre. We're going to go to battlefields. We're going to go in the oceans. And, and all we need is for you to donate your old device that you're done with. I said, do you think three people would do that? in order to go and have their kids have that experience. And she was like, I know they would. And so that's yes and thinking. It's, it's just refusing to look at a problem as unsolvable. And so we try to teach that to our kids starting in kindergarten. Uh, we believe perseverance is one of our eight critical attributes. And so um, that, that, that gives you a tone of, of what yes and thinking is. And how that applies to your lessons are, I don't believe you can do all of the best practice and next practice separately and independently. We teach kids in kindergarten. To pass kindergarten, you have to be able to code. You have to be able to AutoCAD. You have to be able to lead video conferencing. You have to be able to do philanthropy. You have to start on design thinking from Stanford in kindergarten to pass kindergarten. Those are our own set standards. And you say, well, buddy, I don't have time to teach all of that and my content. And my answer to you is, you're right, you don't have time to teach them separately. Yes, I am thinking says, I'm going to go and try to figure out how to embed those things so that I'm getting both of them accomplished at the same time. So you incorporate those concepts and those, those uh, skills and dispositions into your core instruction. That's yes, and thinking. Yes, and thinking, uh, I'm going to show you some images from eminent schools and from some of the, the lessons recently. We were the first public school in America to partner with Apple Business at a corporate level um, where for $500 a year, every kid in the district could be trained in an Apple store, um, unlimited times, night or day, and we were doing field trips. This is when we first got the devices. Um, it, was, it was really powerful learning. We could not afford a new cafeteria expansion and a next generation collaboration center. And so we retrofitted all of the cafeteria booths so that they would be collaboration centers, virtual collaboration centers, for the kids to be able to have a common screen to share their work, to brainstorm. Um, and so we yes and it to do two and one. Um, also, uh, this is Brooke at nine years old. Uh, we had given all of our teachers uh, laptops. We were going one-to-one. -one. When we got here seven years ago, we only had two mobile devices in the whole district. Um, and they were checked out of the library. We now have 1,200 devices for 900 students. Our, our district enrollment has doubled. Uh, we're the first public school in Kentucky. We went from failing AYP for about a decade to going and being the first public school in Kentucky to have 100% college and career ready graduates two years in a row. Nobody's ever done it once, and we've done it twice um, through this uh, personalized learning with best and next practice. And so Brooke, at nine years old, none of our teachers were using the devices. And so we were like, how do we get them to use them mid-year? 
And so Brooke taught herself how to use Keynote, and so she did a three-hour training on Keynote at nine years old for all hundred of our staff. And within ten business days, 87% of them were using them on a daily basis. It was awesome. Um, and so um, it, it was the power of a kid being a learner. I, if you come to Eminence, which all of you are invited, you literally will never walk through our halls that a student is not leading classes and, and teaching instruction um, on a walkthrough. Like you will find one every time and usually two or three. Um, they are truly learning associates and, and with true student agency and student voice. Um, yes and thinking and, and lessons um, don't always occur in the classroom. So this is a professional development that we went, surprised the teachers with, took them to a mall, and then had a virtual experience there to teach them how to start to embed um, some elements of fun and rigor and professional development, just like we were asking them to do in their classrooms. Um, this is a math fraction test. Um, and so um, this was the highest recorded, this was taken about four years ago. This was, up until this time, this was the highest recorded fraction skills for any fourth grade class that we had ever had at eminent schools uh, until this, until, and the teacher, literally her culminating test was creating a pizza. Each kid got a different card with the, the, the fractions of each one that was required on it. And uh, those kids literally blew the socks off of the test that year. Um, you know, it takes courage for a teacher uh, to think differently about um, alternate assessments and for how to make their lessons more engaging and fun. Um, learning just looks different at Eminence now. Kids are making and creating and designing and building. Um, this is a first grade class's exit exam where they had literally, um, they were proving their evidence for why their defense for why they should be allowed to go to second grade. And they had screen captured it, they had narrated it, and then they had to do a defense in front of their peers, um, their parents, and some community members. Uh, just awesome. And we do that at the end of every grade level um, with kids. Um, I think Brooke showed you the kindergarten virtual field trip. Um, some of our K teachers are some of our most innovative ones. Again, remember thinking about that um, video conferencing being a skill that they teach in kindergarten. You say, well, buddy, I have trouble finding other partners across the country to partner with me. But what we do is we, we literally, sometimes it's somebody in another country, and sometimes it's just they're reading aloud to a classmate in the class right next door. The skill is read aloud, which is their core skill that they're working on, phonetic awareness, um, being able to um, hear the word, pacing. And then the, the next generation skill is the video conferencing that they're leading, and the kids literally just in the class next door. And so we get to accomplish both of those in that one lesson. That's just a taste test of it. Um, our kids are building and designing things every day that are literally just amazing. It's heavy on project-based learning, but it's not all-inclusive project-based learning. Like, that's just one element of our school and our classrooms. We do tons of internships. We do tons of, of students with authentic engagement. Um, and so uh, it's very exciting. This was a project that a teacher did that she had a struggling class that was really having a hard time connecting to the content. And so she went and challenged them uh, to go change the world. And so um, as a result of that, we had a bus that we were getting ready to throw away, literally sell for like $300. And I convinced the board to give it to this struggling class and um, say, here's a bus. They'll change the world with the bus. And they decided they wanted to help Nicaragua. And so they, they flew to Nicaragua. They were going to start an English language mentoring peer system where they spoke back uh, with them in the United States. And when they got there, all of the students and families were totally English uh, sufficient. They were, they were very proficient at the English language. They realized they had to do something very different. And so what they did was they found out that they had no pure water. They were hiking for miles each day, each way, to bring water in. So they said, well, we need to give them a water filtration plant. They came back. They designed a multicultural bus experience all about Nicaragua that checked off every program review that elementaries have in Kentucky. And then once it was designed, they, they marketed it and sold it and booked it. And kids all over Kentucky elementary schools booked their bus for $250 a pop. And the bus would come in. They would run through three, 400 kids in a school, and then that school could check off every program review that they had 
and 100% of the money went back to the people in Nicaragua for the water filtration. It, it was just awesome. Um, and those kids were all active learners. This is our kids at a cop giving the pre-prom dare to uh, care, you know, speech on, on drunk driving. And I was like, what are they doing? They're being disrespectful. I got online and on our LMS, and they were fact-checking the police officer and saying, well, some of his facts are a little dated. Some of them are actually uh, right on. And actually, it's a little worse than it is. And, like, it, it was very cool to see. Um, every kid, K through 5, publishes a hardback book. You know, for $10 a kid, we've worked out a deal where um, every kid, K-5, publish a book, and then that book sits in the library to be checked out by their peers for a full year. And at the end of the year, when the new books come out, then they can take their book home with them. Um, and so they'll have six years of, of published books um, to make it work. Uh, our kids do their own, uh, you know, public service announcements, P PSAs. Um, we spend 20% of our year in passion projects. So um, this was a second grade passion project to create a mini library. Um, we had kids do tributes. We had kids do uh, plays and productions and, and uh, raising money for serve. We had a seventh grade kid that raised $20,000 for a service dog for one of our kindergarten students whose families couldn't, couldn't earn it. Um, so 20% of our instruction all year long, it's the Google 20% time concept. They spend 20% of their time on their passion. Uh, we do the same thing with our students. Um, we try to make learning as fun as possible. Um, this is a great one, and, and, and I'll go fast from here on out. We had a third grade class last year uh, that went and raised money for dog treats. They designed their, well, they raised money for their cause, their philanthropy, um, to the Henry County Animal Shelter. They designed their own recipe, and so when they designed their recipe, then they marketed it, sold it. They made like several thousand dollars in the, in the first month. Some of the kids got bored with the project, and some of the kids were still very passionate about it. So the passionate kids about the dog treats kept going with the dog treats, and they were taking some of their profits to do capital venture, uh, capital venture uh, 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 with the other half of the class. And so um, they funded this, the startup business of this other group. All of these other kids did their pitch to the dog treat people, and then they picked one for them to invest in with some of the monies to start a second business all in third grade. Um, literally just uh, awesome. And it says, uh, I see a question, what was the biggest key to changing culture when you started between leadership, board, et cetera, as most folks fear change? Um, it was the power of student success and testimonies. Um, we, we went, and the kids themselves convince the parents. We are a district of poverty. And so um, kids were coming home telling their parents about starting companies, about what they could do on a computer and on a device, and the power of their own stories and how the learning changed literally allowed, it alleviated 95% of all of the fears. Um, it, it was instant buy-in from just the dynamics of going from a totally traditional environment to an environment where kids didn't want to go home. Our, one of our founding principles are we don't want kids to want to go home at the end of the day. And so proud to tell you that our elementary, 60% of our elementary stay Monday through Thursday, two extra hours every single day, every week, because the learning from three to five is that much fun. Um, that's staggering, right? And so, so um, we're getting there. I mean, it, it is... Um, it is awesome. Uh, question, did you try things first and then kind of use the proof is in the pudding concept rather than just talking about it? Uh, yes. We are a jump in fast and make a huge splash. Uh, we have had some belly flops, uh, but for the most part, um, it, it, the water has been perfect. And so um, we are a fail fast district. We like to launch in, and we, if we think it's best for kids, we go and do it. Um, and, then, and then we make the most out of it. And we learn from our failures. We embrace our failures. Every failure we've ever had has led to a better yes and uh, result or uh, solution. And so, yes, uh, we love to just jump in. Um, again, 
we have CNC machines now. We have laser cutters. We have um, 3D printers, sublimation printers. Um, you name it, we want kids to have the ability to do it. We're now micro-credentialing students and staff in these devices and tools so that they can uh, use it to prove their learning and enhance it. This is the, one of the first public looks at our school. We had had a 115-year-old building uh, that we've been in until four weeks or eight weeks ago now. Time's gone fast this semester. Um, we opened up the EdHub, which is the Experimental Da Vinci Hybrid Ultra Biblioteca. Doesn't mean anything to anybody but us. Um, but in this space, it's a K-12 learning lab where the kids can come in, you know, all day long in small groups because the learning is personalized to work on projects to prove learning um, with experts and resources and teachers there to help guide them in their day-to-day -day instruction. How many years did it take uh, you to get here from where you are or where folks started to get on the board to where you are today? Um, it was pretty quick, but I would say two years, a year and a half to two years. It used to take a full year to train people in the mindset um, that we were trying to shoot for. Um, then we got a lot better about our screening for hiring dispositions, and now we can get somebody pretty proficient easily within the first six to nine months. Like within, by Christmas to, the, to their first year, uh, we can get people um, pretty bought in. Um, so anyway, learning is a lot of fun, and uh, we want to be the Disney world of schools. We want it to be a completely personalized experience where creativity uh, reigns. Um, but at the same time, we want our kids to be world class and, and to produce at a world class level. Um, with all of that from Brooke and my presentation, um, do we have any questions that you'd like to share at this time? There's no bad question except one not asked. All right, well, um, I will tell you that um, if you want to follow up with any of these and you want to ask me, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's some down here below. Would you consider coming to my middle school to present? Depends on where you're at. I will say I don't get too many days off. Uh, what recommendations would you give to leadership and board members when starting to present this? Um, I would start with successes. So I would start with um, showing how uh, you could um, transform learning with some of these ideas. Um, I would, if you have the ability, if you're just coming from the teacher level, the more instances of success that you can show um, through your through your own class, it will spread. People have a hard time understanding this until they can see it. So putting it in practice and giving them something to look at, um, and and that that that's where the real change can start to occur. How do we get more leaders like you? And what can states do to get more yes and leaders? I uh, really appreciate that. Um, I don't know the answer to it. I think that it is, it's coming. Um, because what I, I, I have found that being a district of poverty has allowed me to adapt and change quicker because there's a sense of desperation. Like the parents know that what we're doing for their students is creating um, real outcomes and possibilities from them. We were only having about 20% of our students stay in college. As a result of what we're doing now, we're having a 98% rate of kids staying in college that are a part of our our early college program, and most of them are first-generation college students. It's remarkable. It's life-changing. And so um, that's exciting. And, and I was joking with a district that was from wealth that, that didn't see the need to change school. And I said, it's fine. I appreciate you creating a, a qualified workforce for our students to, to lead. Uh, because I said, our folks are going to be the ones that are creating and inventing and designing, and they're going to have those same skills to go with you. Uh, do you have a recording such as this that we can share? Um, yes. Uh, I know last year uh, Anikal, uh recorded the, the keynote speech, which uh, it, it incorporates several of these. Um, and, and so, yes, um, it would be on there. And then um, uh, you could do that. And, and I, I oftentimes don't mind doing Skype sessions with staff, but just it, it, it is tough to come in face-to-face. Well, it's, it's hard to believe, but it's been about an hour, and um, uh, it says, do your ideas usually start as small pilots first, or ideas implemented school district-wide? Um, we usually start with, uh, the, with a pilot on most things, uh, but at the same time, we're a small enough district that we can just launch district-wide, and so um, while that might not be practical for, for everybody, it, it definitely does work for us. 
Um, any future questions, though, I'd be glad to reach out to you. I want to honor your all's time, and I really appreciate for everybody joining and for how kind you are. I, they just posted the YouTube link from, from last year. There's three uh, keynotes on there. The first two are amazing, um, and so um, I'm the third one. Uh, and uh, one of the highest honors of my life was to get to speak at IMECAL since they were really some of the inspiration for, for our work here. Uh, again, you can reach Brooke at, at uh, Twitter. She Nothing makes her happier than when somebody reaches out and thanks her on Twitter. And uh, if you have questions, you can reach me at, at Buddy Berry. And if you just want to follow our school, uh, I saw today that a teacher was doing uh, hissing cockroach races and tracking the time for data analysis. So it was awesome. Um, that's at Eminent Schools, and you can see all of those too. Um, what is the easiest way to recap on everything you presented today? Um, probably to, to watch that keynote version on Anacol, and then um, uh, I believe that this is recorded as well, so you could watch this again a second time as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Natalie and Thank Ashley. Thank you so much, buddy, and please send our thanks to Brooke as well. You are an inspiration as always. Um, I just saw a question pop up. Will Thank the you. keynote link be in the presentation? Um, no, I just threw that in the chat box, though, for you. And you can also find that video on the inacol.org website. You can go to the 2015 Symposium Highlights page, and all the keynote presentations are on there. So you can find buddies. I really encourage you all to watch it. You're so empowering. You really are the Disneyland of schools, and you are a changer of worlds. And um, we really appreciate all your time and for sharing with us tonight. And Thanks. And if you all are in, um, if you're in um, uh, San Antonio, San Brooke has a session down there. And some of it will be, uh, be, be similar, but it would be great to connect face to face. Yeah, and we can send a screenshot, too, of the LMS that you mentioned earlier to show how you're tracking um, those dispositions as well and student passions. That would be excellent to share too. So we will follow up with you all via email and thank you so very much again and hope to see you all in San Antonio. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.